about yeah last year or maybe even a year and a half ago, I forget exactly when, I just realized like you know what a great chance to just build um, you know some some practices, some spiritual disciplines into the life of my son. And so uh, for a good while, uh, I've been trying to uh, talk to him about and teach him uh, a different uh, Bible verse. Uh, every day from 8.25 to 8.40 uh, when I drop him off to school. And so, um, you know, often it has to do with uh, something I'm preaching on. Um, but also sometimes I say, Owen, what do you want to learn about? And he'll say, animals. And so I think he's learned a lot of verses about animals uh, in the Bible, like a dog returning to his vomit and, and those sorts of things. He loves that one. <laughs> As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. Um, anyway, but uh, yeah, what I do is I, I, I tend to uh, write out a verse like on a, on a sticky note and, and give it to him. He can hold it and he sees it. And so he sees it and we talk about it and I ask him questions about it. And so a couple days ago, we were looking at Luke 12, 15 uh, in the NIV translation, which most of you don't have. But uh, in the NIV, it says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. So that's Luke uh, 12, uh, 25. So I was, uh, yeah, talking with Owen about this verse and asking him questions. So I'm saying like, Owen, like, you know, it says, watch out. Uh, Owen, what does it mean to watch out? It means you have to be careful about something. Said so, Owen, what do you need to watch out for? What are the things that you need to watch out for in your life? And he said, dragons and monsters. <laughs> so those are the things that Owen wants to watch out for. Now I would say, okay, that's good. Don't stop doing that. But you know, and I was saying, Owen, it's really important for you to watch out for traffic. You know, obviously that's something that's on my mind as we're walking, you know, on a busy enough street. And, you know, we live, our house is, you know, about, I don't know, four steps away from a busy street. And so I want him, and now that his, as of last week, as his little sister is walking now, I want both of my kids to have a healthy fear of traffic. I want them to watch out for traffic. So I guess traffic plus a child who's not watching out is, is tragedy and, and something terrible. And so we're talking about watching out for traffic and dragons and monsters as well. Uh, but in, in the actual verse that we were looking at and the Luke 12, open on your lap, uh, Jesus tells us what we need to watch out for. In chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus says, watch out be on your guard against all kinds of greed. So as much as a 11-month-old toddler needs to watch out for traffic, uh, Jesus says you need to watch out for greed. And, and interestingly, I just kind of looked it up. This is the only, there's only one other time when Jesus says watch out. The other time is in uh, Mark 13, verse 23. You can look it up later on, but it's a warning against false teaching. Jesus says, watch out, be on the lookout about false teaching. So I think there's something you know, interesting about greed and false teaching, how both of them uh, merit Jesus telling us to watch out for them. I think both of them are sneaky. Um, both of them are subtle. Uh, both of them are dangerous and destructive. Um, and so this morning, we're not going to talk about false teaching. This morning, we're going to talk about the other thing that we need to watch out for, which is greed. So first question, if you have the little booklet too, uh, there's the, the definition of greed. So what is greed? What is this thing we ought to be looking out for, watching out for? Well, a uh, early writer called Thomas Aquinas defines greed as an excessive love or desire for money or what money can buy. I think that's a pretty good definition. Uh, there's, there's more that could be said. Um, someone said that greed 
is when enough isn't enough. But there's got to be more. Uh, the comic strip character Charlie Brown, he says that, you know, life is about just one cookie away from happiness. That perpetual want for just one more cookie, one more thing, one more treat, and then true happiness uh, can be there. So it can be maybe hard to define, as many of these sins or vices are harder to define, but it's when we see it described, when we see it depicted, sometimes it helps us to make a bit more, more sense of it. And literature and film is full of greedy characters. And so if I were to say a name like Ebenezer Scrooge, uh, you know, I don't know what your minds go to, whether it's um, a Muppet's Christmas Carol, that's where my mind goes to, or for you maybe more um, educated, you think of Charles Dickens or um, Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> um, but but uh, that character in whatever, you know, cartoon or you know whether it's typed out um, he's a character who's just described as as greedy uh, there's a line that describes Ebenezer Scrooge you know in his cold house with one uh, candle uh, and it says uh, it was cold but it was cheap and Ebenezer liked it that way so just to save anything that he can uh, as a result of his greed or in J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, book and then recent film adaptations of The Hobbit, uh, there is, I guess, two depictions of greed. greed. There is Smaug the dragon, and once he is vanquished and uh, Thorin Oakenshield, um, then is the new possessor of the treasure under the mountain that Smaug was, was guarding, uh, that he also becomes overcome with greed. And Tolkien calls it dragon sickness, uh, just being obsessed with possessing and being able to think of nothing but what you have. There's films that are definitely um, aimed at an adult audience, like Wolf of Wall Street, or there's films that are addressed at a family audience, like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, that all uh, depict greed in various ugly forms. Um, I'm going to read the, a chunk from Luke chapter 12, um, from verse 13 down to verse 34, where we're going to see an example of greed, a warning against greed, and then Jesus gives some direction as to how to be free from greed. So just as a bit of context, in chapters like 11 and 12, Jesus is really like clearly communicating important truths to his hearers. He, he's talking about, um, you know, his coming resurrection. He's talking about the dangers of hypocrisy. He's, he's really covering a lot of important ground. And then someone like asks a question and you know as a, as a teacher whether you're teaching in secondary school primary school if you've ever I guess led a community group or a Bible discussion group it's great when someone asks a question but sometimes people ask questions and this kind of proves that they're not listening to anything you're saying so after after like you know two and a half chap or one and a half chapters of like Jesus teaching incredibly wonderful truths uh, verse 13 <clears throat> says uh, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He's like, Jesus, that's, that's really interesting what you're talking about. But we have some family squabbles that have to do with finances. Could you just stop what you're doing and sort us out? Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, man, who made you a judge or an arbitrator over you? Sorry, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And then he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And then he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns 
and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And then I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They neither have storehouses nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which one of you, by being anxious, can add a single span to his life? If then you are not able to do as small as thing as that, then why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, and with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, Jesus was interrupted uh, by a question that he discerned uh, was motivated by greed. And then there he tells a story about a man who only thought about this present age and his wealth at that moment, but did not plan into the future of his natural nor eternal life. And then he speaks to them. He kind of repeats what he said uh, in Matthew 6 on the Sermon on the Mount. He says it again. He reuses material (laughs) because it's worth saying twice. He tells them that They do not need to worry about the little things in life because their Heavenly Father promises to look after them. He encourages them away from greed and towards trust in God. You'll see those things are the two competing options that Jesus seems to understand and that we ought to understand as well. Uh, Greed is this sin or this vice that adores the temporary things, and ignores the everlasting things. Uh, The uh, Middle Ages, I think Middle Ages, the author uh, Dante, who wrote the the book Dante's Inferno, where he imagines a lot of things. It's not it's not super accurate, but he imagines the the place in, in hell where greedy people are. And he says that because it's an obsession with the things of earth and ignoring the things of heaven, he imagines that they are chained to the ground with their backs turned towards heaven and their eyes chained towards the earth. That's his imagination. But why does Jesus, back to scripture, tell us to watch out and be on our guard against greed? He doesn't just do it here. He doesn't just, in Luke chapter 12, address greed or money in this isolated uh, once-off sense. Uh, He actually speaks about money and it's a danger of greed, but then also the potential blessing of using it, investing it into the kingdom of God, uh, a lot. He speaks about greed more than any other sin. Jesus speaks about the human desire to possess and hoard. Uh, He speaks about our hope of placing them in fleeting resources and not in the God of heaven a lot. So remember, he tells us just once to watch out for this. He never tells us to watch out for 
adultery. He never tells us to watch out for, uh, you know, lust or envy or these other uh, deadly sins that we'll see. Uh, Somebody did the math, and I have to just trust this other writer, um, that there are 10 times more references from the teaching of Jesus about money and what to do with it than sex and what to do with sex. And so because there's 10 times more warning about the one than the other, then perhaps spiritually speaking, the same could be said about sex and money as could be said about Saul and David. That sex has slain its thousands and greed has slain its tens of thousands. Just doing the math. But I believe one of the dangers of this and we'll talk about this later on, that we're not, we don't want to be money negative, but we want to be opposed to what God opposes, which is greed. Greed separates us from God because it places a substitute savior in the place where only God ought to be. We're focused on acquiring more stuff or maintaining what we have rather than going deeper in our relationship with God, rather than maintaining fellowship with the King of Kings. Uh, and in the New Testament book of uh, uh, Titus, Ephesians, the New Testament, <laughs> chapter 3 of a book, Colossians, that's it, top of my head. Colossians 3.5, uh, I think, speaks about um, greed as idolatry, <clears throat> where Paul makes it plain that it's not just a matter of liking something bad, but it's a matter of substituting something good for God himself. That greed is taking the place that only God ought to occupy. Um, Greed causes us to trust in money or things for our happiness, for our security, for our sense of worth. And God himself stands as the giver of true joy, of ultimate security and eternal worth. We substitute him for something less. And my friends, that is the definition of idolatry. There's the ancient... Irish Christian hymn that that I love and it has the line that says riches I heed not nor man's empty praise thou mine inheritance now and always thou and thou only the first in my heart high king of heaven my treasure thou art it's good it's good to good to sing words like that that have been sung so many times over the years in this very place but but greed inverts those wonderful words and that that statement of trust in God. So the greedy heart longs for riches as the eternal inheritance. I want riches to be my hope. Greed causes us to lay up treasure on earth rather than seeing the king of heaven as our one true and lasting treasure. Another example of many examples uh, in scripture of greed is another story Jesus told. Uh, We we call it the story of the prodigal son. Um, He is a young man who, as Jesus tells us, would much rather have money and the things money can buy than a relationship with his loving father. Uh, And then eventually, towards the end of the story, the prodigal son comes to his senses and then he realizes what many people realize at the end of their lives. And what he realizes is that it, it isn't enough. That, that, all, that he could swap a relationship with his father for anything else, and that eventually is going to run dry, it's going to be exhausted, it will run on fumes, and then it will die on the side of the road. It's not enough. There's a, an ancient historian and writer uh, by the name of Pliny the Younger, and he speaks about the uh, uh, things that he desired. And he says that an object in possession seldom retains the same charm that it had in pursuit. He's like, I, wanted, I like the idea of getting something. And I chased after it. And then once I got it, it didn't have the same charm. But it was an idea. Uh, you want something so bad, you're willing to do anything to get it. You do whatever you have to do to get it. And you get it and you're disappointed once it's there in your hands. Uh, Aquinas also spoke about uh, that when we possess the object of our greed or our lust or our envy even, he said it's only when it's ours that we realize its insufficiency. And there is a haunting uh, quote from Jim Carrey, of all people. 
I think I've said this before about a year or two ago, maybe one or two of you remembers, <laughs> but, but Jim Carrey says, I hope that everybody could become rich and famous and have everything they ever dreamed of so that they could know that it's not the answer. Like Jim Carrey has made me laugh a lot, especially in my teenage years. But, but now as an adult and, and, and just him saying, I wish people could know that being rich and famous and having everything is not going to ultimately answer you. So he's been one who's tried. It's like a secular version of the book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon speaks about his pursuits and his acquisitions and the pleasures that he's gotten. But then he says, it's just vanity. It's just chasing after the wind. Proverbs 27 verse 20 says that death and destruction are never satisfied and neither are human eyes. It says that just as much as like people are always going to die. It's just, it's the way of the world that every day people are born, people die. Uh, he says that ongoing process and cycle, it's like human eyes. We're never going to be satisfied with what we see and want and have. There never comes to a point when we say, oh, that's enough. And my final quote, I lumped them all together, um, is from one of my favorite preachers, Charles Spurgeon. Uh, he says that, you say, if I only had a little bit more, then I'll be satisfied. He says, you make a mistake. If you're not content with what you have right now, then you're not going to be content if it were to be doubled. You're, you're never going to have enough. So there, I have Proverbs, Jim Carrey, Charles Spurgeon, and they all happen to say the same thing on this one point. So it's not enough. So the prodigal son looks and says, this isn't enough. Jim Carrey looks and says, this isn't enough. And so then what, what is the problem? And if you're taking notes, I want to say money is not the problem. Loving money is the problem. You know, there's an often misquoted verse in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, which supposedly says, you know, money is the root of all evil. Uh, and that's, that's misquoted so, so often. Uh, what it does say is that it's the love of money, which is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not that much better, <laughs> but it is different. It's not that money is evil, but it's the love of money that causes all kinds of evil. Now, if, we're, if you're expecting to come and see, oh, it's a sermon on greed, you know, we're going to talk about how money is bad. No, money is not bad. Loving money is. There are many wealthy people in the Bible that are spoken of in high terms. Uh, I, I can't help but think of uh, Abraham, who is referred to as the father of faith. You know, we're, we look to him as an example of faith, and we know that he was a man of considerable wealth. Uh, the New Testament also speaks very highly of Job. James speaks of Job as a, as a role model to us as far as patience goes. We know Job was a man of considerable wealth. Uh, the New Testament speaks of a, a woman by the name of Lydia, who was a wealthy businesswoman. And then Paul, at the end of some of his letters, especially uh, Romans chapter 16, he thanks people for their financial patronage of him. Often patronage doesn't mean they're patronizing him, talking down to him all the time. Patronage means funding him. And so he was funded from people who had money, who kept his ministry going. And aren't we thankful for them? Isn't it great that some people had money, worked hard, earned money, and supported Paul so that we could read books like Romans? So anyway, so loving money is not a problem. Sorry, loving money is a problem, but money is not. So there's many examples of generous and wealthy people in scripture. And there also are examples of greedy people that we find in the Old and the New Testament. The Bible includes um, greedy people uh, in its stories so that we can see the destructive power of this sin and learn from their mistakes and be warned by their example. If you're taking notes, you can just jot down the greedy man Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 21, just really, really briefly, if you're not unfamiliar with the story, he is this king, he's so wealthy, but his neighbor has uh, some land that he wants 
to expand. He wants to have a garden that goes into his property. He asks the guy, can I buy it from you? The guy says, no, sorry, it's part of the family. It's part of my inheritance to my children. And so it describes how he is sullen and vexed and he goes to bed and he faces the wall and he's not going to eat because he's so greedy and envious of this plot of land that he wants. So then his wife Jezebel kind of like rubs his back and like, what's the matter, honey? I really want the field, but he's not selling me the field. And then so she goes and she uh, institutes or, or works a way of causing his death so that her sad, greedy husband can expand his garden into the property that used to be uh, the poor neighbor. Gehazi in 2 Kings 5 is another example of a man who gives in to greed, 2 Kings 5. And in the New Testament, there's a couple of greedy people here and there, but none uh, deserve to be highlighted more than the greedy man, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed the Lord Jesus, for 30 pieces of silver. Now, certainly, he probably had a variety of motives, but one that the scripture highlights for us is his greed for money. So since money isn't the problem, and loving money is the problem, uh, that means that you don't actually have to have a lot of it to be greedy. Now, you know, I, I, I watched the documentary that came out, I guess, last week on RTE with David McWilliams. Maybe some of you saw it, some of you didn't. But talking about, uh, you know, this certain 1% of Ireland's population that through the Celtic tiger, through the bubble, through the crash, through austerity, um, has remained incredibly wealthy and, in fact, has actually been making more money uh, during this time. And... Uh, You know, when we think about greed, we think, oh, yeah, like those guys, you know, the bankers or the the, the property developers, you know, we we think of greedy people as as out there. But, you know, the sermon isn't really going to be about them. Two reasons. They're not here. Or if they are, I don't know who they are. And they certainly aren't tithing. (laughs) (laughs) But that's one of you, like, there's room for you. (laughs) Um... Anyway, <laughs> um, but, but it's, it's so easy for us. You see, greed is one of these like deadly sins or any sins that like our, our culture tends to agree with scripture on. Uh, sometimes like, there's a variety of things that we're going to see. We've covered that like as believers in scripture, as Christians, we're kind of weird, culturally speaking, for holding certain things. But I think this current day and age, this time and place that we're in, uh, agrees that, yeah, that greed is destructive, that greed is bad, that we'd be better off without greedy people being allowed to do what they want to do. If we were to go on Patrick Street right now, you'd be very hard-pressed to find somebody who disagrees with the biblical statement that, that greed is destructive and and dangerous. But what you're not going to find on Patrick Street is people that say, and I am greedy. Like we, we off, it's so easy to identify that in somebody else, especially when there's such exaggerated cartoon examples out there of what greed looks like that we need to remember, it's not how much money you have, it's how you feel about the money that you have. Uh, Cassian, a sixth century Christian, he says this, it's possible for those who are not weighed down by much money to be condemned alongside the wealthy for their dispossession and attitude. So, in other words, you don't actually have to have a lot of money to be greedy. Your heart can be stingy. Your money can be an idol, whether it's a whole lot or a little. If your idol is something that you bought at Brown Thomas or Michael Guiney's, it still can be a replacement for God in your life. So please don't just say, oh, those bankers really should hear this sermon. Say, I could be greedy as well. Remember, Luke 12, 15, watch out for all kinds of greed. That means that there's different kinds of greed. There's the kind of greed that has a lot of money. There's the kind of greed that doesn't have much, but is obsessed with the money that they have. Like Ebenezer Scrooge, like he had a lot, money was his God, but you couldn't tell by looking at his house. He, he loved money too much to spend it. 
and to pay his employees. But then also you could think of a, a different variety or species of greed that isn't like Ebenezer Scrooge, but that is like, you know, bling and wants to show off and wants to make sure that everyone knows how flashy they are. So be on the lookout for all kinds of greed. I'd say both kinds, but there's probably a third and fourth and fifth way that I haven't thought of yet. Um, so greed is a sin of the hands. And, and you'll notice we're kind of talking about the anatomy of sin these days. And there's like different kind of like body parts like on the wall there behind me. And, and this week, it's, it's hands. And they're actually kind of like dragon hands, you know? You can look at it later on. I have to stand here because the mic. But there's, there's hands. And I think, I think hands are a good symbol for what, what greed is. Because greed, basically, it's about wanting more than our hands can hold. Um, we want to keep our hands gripping tight of something small and then being unwilling to release that for something truly great. I think I've told this story before. But I've been preaching in so long, I have to tell the same stories every once in a while. But, um, you know, I think in the American South back in the day, like um, people would catch raccoons, which are a kind of a, a menace and a, you know, a big rodent. And so to catch raccoons, uh, you know, farmers, etc., they would, you know, put these like coffee cans in the ground with like something shiny, like a bit of tin foil uh, on the inside. And the raccoon looks and, and sees something shiny and its little raccoon mind thinks, oh, I like that. And then sticks his hand in to grab it and then makes a fist around, you know, whatever shiny like nuts and bolts, whatever. And then when it comes time to pull, you know, his or her little raccoon hand out, it can't because it makes a fist and so it doesn't fit out. And so these poor critters, I guess, are, are stuck there with their hands and they're scrambling all over the place, but it doesn't cross their minds that if they were to just release what they're holding on to, then they could escape. And then when the farmer comes along with his club or whatever to, to end their little raccoon lives, you know, they could have escaped if they just released what they were holding on to with their hands. On another note, I came across this, this proverb, not from the book of Proverbs, but just a, a Spanish saying, I think. Um, if a greedy person is drowning, and if you're like in a boat and trying to help them, you don't say, give me your hand, because a greedy person doesn't know how to give. You need to say, take my hand, because that's all they know how to do. So it's a sin of the hands, we could say, but I would also say it's probably a sin of the eyes um, as well. Uh, we, we look and we see the world. Uh, we see, you know, euro signs and value and what can we gain from the world rather than what can we contribute or give. And then another aspect that affects our eyes is that it often causes us to be blind to our own greed. Very rarely is a greedy person aware that they are a greedy person. Again, it's often the 1% or it's someone else out there. So how do you know if you're greedy? Uh, Alistair Begg, Scottish preacher, gives eight indicators that you might be a greedy person. Uh, number one, when thoughts of money consume your day. Number two, when the financial success of others makes you jealous. Number three, when you are tempted to define success by what you have rather than who you are in Christ. <coughs> Number four, uh, when you neglect your family in pursuit of money. Uh, number five, when you close your eyes to the genuine needs of others. Uh, number six, when you live in paralyzing fear of losing your money. Uh, number seven, when you're prepared to borrow yourself into bondage rather than lower your standard of living. And number eight, when God receives your leftovers rather than your first fruits. That's a lot. I'll post them online or you could look at my notes afterwards. So if you are, if you tick a few of those, if those shoes fit, then you probably will be interested in what is the, the cure for greed. How do, we, how do we deny 
greed. Having defined it and described it, how do we deny it? Well, in your little booklets, um, Ephesians 4.28 is listed there as a way to deny greed uh, in our lives. It's, uh, it's one verse. Uh, listen along as I read it. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.28 says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So that's not the only verse about defeating greed in our life, but it's one of them. <laughs> one of the first ones that we're going to talk about. Uh, he addresses the, the thief. And of course, there's various socioeconomic, and of course, there's various sinful motives that go into the act of theft. But for the sake of argument, maybe we can agree that thievery uh, is connected to greed. Maybe not 100%, or, but I'd say there's a strong correlation between greed and theft. And Paul addresses the thief and says, this is what you need to do, thief. Two things. Number one, get a job. Number two, and this is the most important thing, give away your money. And I don't think this is penance. This is not uh, this idea of, well, you've done bad deeds, so you need to do good deeds so that everything's cool at the end. But I believe that Paul here, in this one little verse, is giving instruction on how this reformed thief is to free himself from the enslaving grip of greed. It's just give it away. Give your money away. Having money or things was this thief's uh, security. Paul says repent of that and start looking at money and things as something to bless others with rather than something to hoard for yourself. Get a job, work with your hands, earn things, and then give them away to those that have need of them. Ephesians 4, 28. Isn't it frightening, though, to be honest, to think about if we change the way that we think about money, uh, that that could change everything, right? If we stop thinking about money as that which we keep and start thinking about it as something that we can or should be giving away, that could change the way our lives work. It's frightful to think about that. And I think God knows that it's frightening. And there are two significant sections of scripture where God addresses our fear and generosity. If you still have your Bibles open to Luke 12, uh, I'd like to point down to the last section that we read, verses 32 and 34. Fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in heavens that do not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus says one of the solutions to greed is to give your money away to people who need it more than you. But before he says that, he says, fear not. Don't be afraid. It's almost like he's saying, I know this is a frightening consideration. Don't be afraid, but give your money away. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, the author of Hebrews says something similar. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6. The author says, keep your life free from the love of money. Not money, but the love of money. And be content with what you have. For he, for God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So in speaking about money and generosity and trusting in God, we see two different times we're told in scripture, don't be afraid about trusting God with finances. It's because for the world, money is the antidote to fear. 
But Jesus wants to gently pry it out of our hands and make a better offer and say, trust in me instead. And he's so gentle. And so when we have a little extra, we have an opportunity to be generous. And God is a generous God. And so that means that we have an opportunity to be God-like. Ephesians 5 verse 1 says, be imitators of God. So God has shown himself in so many ways to be so generous towards us. And we have a chance to be generous towards others. So I have, I don't know about you guys, but I have been loving slash hating this series. Um, Because every week, God gives me a chance to learn and experience whatever topic I'm teaching on. Um, Last week, uh, so last week, my, or the week before last, yeah, my beloved bicycle got stolen. I love that thing with all my heart, with, with some of my heart. <laughs> I, I like it a lot. <laughs> and so as I'm walking everywhere these days, fuming, hoping to see my bike get ridden past me so that I could tackle the guy. Um, you know, but then I, I was coming up to last Sunday and to know that like, I got to like open God's word and talk to people about anger and the dangers of anger and what wrath and, and the cure for anger. And so I had opportunities in the, in the days leading up to last Sunday to get my heart right, to um, be able to speak about anger uh, and not be, you know, struck dead for hypocrisy uh, whilst doing it. Um, and, and this, these couple days leading up to this Sunday, you know, I'm preaching on greed and, you know, like, wouldn't you know it, you know, the new iPhone is coming out. (laughs) Um, it's out in Australia. It's not out in Ireland yet, but like, you know, this week I've been like, you know, thinking about it and like trying hard not to be like, you know, reading up on the latest things or whatever. Um, and, and I'm thinking like, okay great, this is how God is teaching me about greed this week, you know, by uh, allowing me to not become obsessed with the latest eye gadget that's about to come out. I was like, okay, cool. I just won't go on those sites. I won't think about it. Got it. And then I'll have a pure conscience and I could preach on, on Sunday with my integrity intact. Um, so that was, kind of, that was kind of one half of it. That's what I thought, I guess. That's what I thought how God was teaching me this week about greed. Um, but that's half of it. I guess the other half came uh, when uh, my wife, Rachel, um, let me know about a need that other people had, that there's people that we trust and believe in uh, that have a, um, yeah, just a, a lack. And, you know, she said to me, like, maybe we could meet their need. Maybe we could help them uh, with some money. And it's like, oh, okay. Like that is the solution for greed. Not just avoiding tech blogs, not just not having a new iPhone. Not having an iPhone is easy. <laughs> but generosity, that's an opportunity to, to say, well, do I, do I really believe in this? So greed is not just to be looked at as a negative to avoid, but also there's the vice, but there's the accompanying virtue of generosity that comes alongside. So pray for me next week. Um, Luke 12, uh, verse 31, we looked at 32, jump up to verse 31. Uh, Jesus is telling uh, his hearers, you and me, about the Father's desire and and concern about our day-to-day needs. And he says, you know, in essence, don't worry about even the small things about eating, drinking, clothing. He's like, your father is going to look after you. And then verse 31, instead, seek his kingdom and then these things will be added to you. 
So seeking God's kingdom rather than our own little kingdoms. He says, well, God's going to add these things unto you. And I didn't ask permission, nor do I have time to tell all this story. But uh, Mark Payton uh, told me a great story on Friday about an opportunity when he had, forgive me if it's, to be generous, to be more than fair uh, to somebody else. And he said, you know, it's the right thing to honor God and to be more than generous in an area of finances to somebody else. And then he was just grinning to say, to say like how the surprising ways that God added unto him on like Friday morning and later Thursday night. So I don't have permission to get into all the details or time, but talk to Mark afterwards if you want to hear a cool story. So greed, it holds possessions in its scaly dragon hands with its unyielding grip. And then our giving, our generosity, uh, is part of hopefully a habit um, of loosening that grip uh, that, that says, nope, I'm not going to hold on to that. I'm going to depend on God. So are we, are we generous people? Now, I gave an, an eight-point list previously, and I maybe have just, I could possibly give an eight-point list to, to do a diagnosis about are we generous, um, but for the sake of time and succinctness. Um, you know, one, one writer, uh, Tim Keller, he points out, he says that our tithe or our giving to the work of the church is an evidence of either greed or generosity. He's got this great thick book that I'm almost done with called Center Church, and it's kind of this manual about urban church planting. And he says that a very practical way to see whether a church is succeeding in passing on the importance of their vision to the congregation is through giving. He says that a healthy church or a healthy church planting movement will have a culture of sacrifice. Uh, this quote that I underlined and caused me to go away and think, he says, if the senior leaders in a church are the only ones making sacrifices, then you do not yet have a healthy, viable church. So how's Calvary Cork doing in this regard? We could do better. There are many people who believe in our vision and the work that we're doing in Cork City, and some of them are sacrificially giving of their money to fund it. Um, I do look forward to the day when Calvary Cork will be completely self-sufficient, uh, not only paying for our own building uh, and our own expenses and our own outreaches, which we're doing, great job guys, uh, but also one day paying the salary of its staff, one day being able to make additional hires. It'd be great to have a full-time kids worker, full-time evangelist, um, administrative assistant. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> um, I, I look forward to those sorts of things. And, and then one day to then be a funnel of generosity to others funding more church plants throughout urban and rural Ireland. Like those are, those are great things, but that's not going to happen until there's a church-wide culture of sacrificial generosity, a culture of rhythmic, systematic, joyful giving. And, and we're going to gain that. We can gain that not by Tim Keller quotes. <laughs> as good as I like that guy. Not by sermons on greed. This one's nearly over, but by, by looking to Jesus. Uh, because 2 Corinthians uh, points the, the eyes of the Christian to the work of the Lord Jesus to inspire generosity. So again, we're not just looking to, see, to be not greedy, but we want to be God-like, Christ-like, which is one of generosity. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Those are your homework assignments. Look at those two chapters and see how the Apostle Paul connects the generosity of Jesus with the congregational giving. But the, uh, to highlight just a few verses, 2 Corinthians 8 verses 7 to 9 says this, But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you also excel in this act of grace also. I say this as a command. Sorry, I say this not as a command. Oops. 
but to prove the earnestness of others that your love also is genu genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. So Paul says, I'm not here to command you. I'm not here to yell at you. I'm not here to, to insist on anything. But I just want to remind you of the incredible generosity of Jesus and that he gave up the wealth of heaven to come and be born in a stable and live a life where he says in his own words that there was at least a moment or time when he says he had no place to lay his head. He says that he gave up his wealth for you so that you might be enriched. And then he says, so Corinthians, are you going to do the same for others? Are you going to forego some luxuries in order to be generous? He says that that's the example of Christ. So Jesus treasured us. He sacrificed and he gave everything for us. Jesus became poor for us. And so we can look to him. We can look to his love for us, his example to us. And then that can teach us to be free from the grip of greed, but not just that, to be freed towards the grace of generosity. So I'm going to pray, and then Dave's going to lead us in some songs. Uh, we have opportunities to, to think and to reflect, to stand and stretch out our hands and sing loudly in gratitude to what the Lord Jesus has done, or to quietly think and mull these things over in our hearts to ask God, what should my response be to this? To confess our greed, to repent of our greed, uh, to receive uh, from the Lord. Uh, the Lord's table is there with these elements of the Lord's self-emptying for us. And then, you know, the box is there. You are under no obligation or compulsion, but just throwing it out there. And I trust the Lord will work in us as we deal with these heart issues that work themselves out to our hands. So let's pray. So Lord, as with always, there's always more that could be said. And of course, things could be said better. But Lord, I do believe that your truth has been opened and applied. And for that, I thank you. Father, I pray that the work of your Holy Spirit would be evidenced, Lord, uh, through changes in motivations, Lord, that this 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 type logic of thinking of the generosity and sacrifice of Christ would move us towards being generous and sacrificial people. Please, Lord, be honored in our midst. Thank you, Lord, that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Please, Lord, by your grace, lead us from greed and lead us into, Lord, contentment, gratitude, and generosity. I pray this in Jesus' name.